Good morning, Cross Point. Welcome to Palm Sunday. We're going to worship Jesus. Our soon returning King. Spread their clothes on the road 
Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Jesus. Oh, everything must bow before Jesus. Lord God, we just come before you this morning and we just declare that we are yours. We declare that everything, all the struggles that we go through, everything that happens to us in this life, Lord, bows to the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just come before you right now and we offer up this sacrifice of praise to you. And we say, Lord, we need you. We desire you. And we would love the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you. We just thank you, Lord, that you are here with us, that your presence is here. And Lord, when your presence is here, healing is here. And Lord, we just pray for all those that are sick, for those that, are, that have had really tough weeks this week. Lord, I ask that you would restore what the enemy is trying to steal. Lord, I ask that you would return health, that you would return joy, that you would return peace. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that people would find their fulfillment, not in the things of this world, but in you, in your awesome and powerful name. Lord, we thank you. We desire you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Crosspoint family. It's good to see you all here this morning. Take just a moment. Greet those around you. Let everybody know it's going to be a great week this week. Good to be in church on this beautiful Sunday morning. I just want to say welcome to everybody and a special welcome to all our visitors. Uh, we're so honored that you chose to worship with us this morning. 
And I just want to say, I know visiting church can be a little awkward, so it's our goal just to make this a comfortable experience for you. And we just pray that you'll see God in everything from the worship to the time at the coffee bar to the message. And again, we just want to welcome you. And if you're a first-time visitor, we have a special little gift we'd like to give you. You may have picked it up on the way in at the information desk. But if you didn't, please stop by afterwards where someone will be there to get you a bag and answer any questions you might have about the church. Uh, We also want to ask the visitors if you would please just fill out this welcome card. Um, It just gives us some information about you. And you don't need to put it in the offering. Don't worry. You have plenty of time. There's um, two boxes um, at the exit on each door right here and right here to the right that you can just drop it in there um, when you're finished. And at the bottom, it's a lot of information. At the bottom, there's a place for prayer requests and praise reports. So for anyone, if you'd like to fill that out and drop it in, the church staff would be happy to pray for you. And if you have an answer to prayer, please feel free to, sh- feel free to share it there because they would like to celebrate with you as well. Well, you may have noticed that the stage looks a little different this morning. It's a little pink and sparkly, not our normal stage set, but that's because we had Awakening, our women's conference this last Friday and Saturday with a yes, with our very dynamic speaker, Jennifer Jones. She was just a little bundle of energy and inspiration, Um, a strong, godly woman, I think, who really inspired us to live not just a comfortable life, but a courageous and brave life. So uh, I just want to take a quick moment and thank everyone who was a part of that, all the ladies in this audience um, that I see here. Thank you so much for your service, for your tireless efforts, for your cheerful effort, the many hours we put in. And I also want to say just a special thank you to the men of this church who are amazing. Yes, we could not have done it without you, seriously. So many men were up here throughout the week on uh, scaffolding and ladders, hanging things, putting up banners for us, lights. And even the men that came out Friday night and Saturday, I know that's not exactly where you want to be in a pink sparkly room on a Friday night and a Saturday morning, but they came and ran sound and made coffee and played in the worship band, and we just want you to know that we really appreciate you so much. We appreciate you guys so much, and thank you. All right, well, at this time, we're going to take the offering. So if the men would come forward, would you please just bow with me in prayer? God, we are so thankful for your faithfulness, God, just for your faithfulness to speak to us. Um, It was so evident this weekend, God, that you are here in this place, that your presence is uh, a tangible thing, God, that we can touch and feel. We just thank you for uh, the message that you brought, God. We thank you for the message that's going to land in the hearts of these women and take this church forward, God. We thank you that you are uh, our loving Father. We thank you that you care about each one of us in our lives. And God, we just want to give back to you in some small way. We want to give these tithes and offerings to you and your kingdom, God. We uh, trust that you're going to multiply them and that you're going to use them, God, just to change people's lives. Again, we just want to honor you, God, and we want to give to you with a cheerful heart. We thank you for all your blessings. In In your name, Jesus, amen. Mark your calendars for the 6th Annual St. Paul Children's Foundation Bass Tournament on Saturday, April 18th. We are looking for volunteers to sell raffle tickets and help out on the day of the event. Please sign up to volunteer at the Welcome Center or see Dale Robertson or Pastor Jonathan for more information. Easter weekend is just a couple short weeks away. Be sure to join us Friday, April 3rd at 7 p.m. for a Good Friday communion service. And kids, come out for the epic egg hunt on Saturday, April 4th at 10.30 a.m. All ages are welcome. 
We are gathering candy for this event and are in need of your donations. Please drop the candy by the church office and see Kathy Dixon for more information. And don't miss Easter Sunday. We invite you and your family to celebrate with us. Hey, Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no it's not. Yes it is. No, it's yes, not. Yes it is. No. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this, Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. That's what I meant. Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post-dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now, you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that, and probably... Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony is not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. It's still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus just told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people. and That's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but... The and the king, riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches, the palm branches symbolize triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The bra palm thought... branches, palm the Sunday. I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. All right. Well, happy Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Awesome. It's good to see you all here this morning. Everybody awake and alive and ready to go? Yes. All right. Well, we have quite a bit to cover. And I just want to, before we uh, jump into the Word, and we're going to go to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. And we're also going to uh, talk a lot about Ruth today. So we're going to go to those two, two books of the Bible. But before um, I get started, I just wanted to say how proud I am of the women uh, of this church. They did such a great job. There were so many people working and, and serving and loving others. Uh, when you, Friday night, I just, I was moved. I was standing in the sound booth just praying over people. And just to see how flooded this altar was with people. Because when, that, when, the, when this is filled with people, that means Jesus is healing. 
And it's not about how many people came up. It's about how many people got healed. And I, that excites me. And I love seeing that. So um, great job, ladies. And I look forward to next year. Um, maybe not as pink and uh, maybe not as glittery, please. But other than that, and all the men said amen. So anyways, let's just jump right into this. Uh, I'm excited about this Palm Sunday. God has uh, given us a, a, a great word this morning, and um, I, I love it when he teaches me as I sit, sit there and prepare, and I just sit there and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, God, you're really good. So it's, it, it's, it's a great day. But the goal of today, the goal of this morning comes from Hosea 2.15, and, I, and we're going to, this is going to be our journey throughout this morning. And it says this, God's love is all about transforming you from the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And that's what we're going to do this morning. I believe that we are going to allow God to transform us through his love from the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. So y'all ready? Okay, Lamentations. Lamentations 3 verse 16 says this, he has made me chew on gravel. He has rolled me in the dust. Peace has been stripped away, and I have forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. So inspiring, isn't it? Aren't you all excited to be here this morning? I mean, thank you so much, Pastor John, for, for having us come and, and hearing he has made me chew on gravel. There's, oh man, I, I'm full of something right now. But this is, a, this is Jeremiah here, and, and this is when Israel has basically just separated themselves from God. And he is in such anguish and grief over what is happening. His heart is torn. He's at the lowest point of his life. He has never been, and this is, we have to look at it, this is a prophet of God. If a prophet of God can get this low, do you think the enemy is going to stop with us? I mean, he's going to come after us. He's going to come after us hard. See, Jeremiah is this great prophet, and he went after him. And there was division in the land. Israel, Israel was so far from God. Jeremiah just, peace has been stripped away. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. That's a powerful statement. Everything I have hoped for from the Lord is lost. Can I, can I just be very real and honest with you? I felt like that. I've been there. I don't know if you have, but I've been there. I have felt like everything, like God just took it all away. Like I've made too many mistakes. And it was hard. I felt so low. And we, we all, I believe that we've all been there. Everything I hope from for the Lord is lost. And here's what happens. We start blaming the Lord. Because we have to blame somebody. So we start blaming the Lord. Now, Here's what's really happening. The purpose of the enemy is to steal, kill, and destroy. And what he's going to do is he's going to come in and try to steal one thing that just gives you so much life, and that is hope. He tries to steal your hope, and he's going for it every day because he knows if he can steal your hope, he can steal your joy. If he can steal your hope, he can steal your dreams. And if he can steal your hope, he can steal your desire for God. He's all about coming and and ripping things away. And at this moment, can you imagine the, the spiritual warfare that Jeremiah is going through? He is going right into it. Spiritual warfare. What happened on Palm Sunday? Spiritual warfare was happening. As Jesus submitted himself and put himself on that donkey, 
and he rode into town, and people were shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, what do you think was happening in the spiritual realm? Things were shaking. The enemy was not happy, and he was ready to kill. He was ready to steal people's hope, and he had people so indoctrinated with religion that they, that's what their hope was in. And they had forgotten about the hope that Jesus brought. I want to talk to you this morning about someone who, who uh, lost a lot of hope. But before we turn there, verse 21 of what we just read. With all this despair going on, this is what it says. Yet I still dare to hope. Jeremiah, no matter with everything that was going wrong, he says this, yet I still dare to hope. So let's turn to Ruth. I'm going to give you a little backstory, quick backstory here. Uh, Naomi and her husband, uh, they left Israel and they went to settle in their own land. They went to produce crops and, and build a future for themselves in, their, in this own place. And so Naomi and her husband go away. They had two sons. The two sons end up marrying Moabite women, Gentile women, okay? And uh, one lady's name is Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophrah, okay? And the other one is Ruth. And so things are going well. Things are going very good. They're being prosperous in everything they do. They, they're gaining momentum. Uh, they are, their, their name is being no, well, very well known. Things are happening in their land. And then all of a sudden, Naomi's husband dies. And then soon after that, the two sons die. So Naomi is left with all these things and two daughter-in-laws. It's very difficult. And in the Jewish custom, when you've lost your husband, you kind of lost your namesake. Okay, so she is, she is pretty down at this moment and she tells these two girls go back to your homeland go back to where you're from go back because I can give you nothing I am nothing and one went back but Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 says this but Ruth replied don't ask me to leave you and turn back wherever you go I will go wherever you live I will live your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. How do you say anything to that? How do you say anything? Where you die, that's where I'm going to die. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you live, that's where I'm going to I'm going to take everything that I know about my people and my customs, and I'm going to serve your God. That's commitment. That's commitment. Kind of reminds me of our commitment that we, we should be making as the bride of Christ. Lord, wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you say, I will, just, I will say. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. Wherever you want me to, me to die, that's where I will go to die. We make a covenant See, Ruth just made this covenant to Naomi. What covenant have we made to God? Wherever you go, right? See, I believe that we're about to see a picture of Jesus that is so pure and so awesome, but it's just a picture of what was to come. So Naomi, she, take, she can, goes back home. But she's feeling so bad. She is in the valley of trouble. She is so deep in the valley of trouble that she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Wow. That's intense. That is intense. Don't even call me what the name that, that God gave me. Call me this because he's made my life miserable. I want you to know 
God has a plan for everything. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your life. It doesn't matter what's going on. He has a plan. It doesn't matter if you're feeling 10, high, ten times high or you are down in the valley of trouble. He has a plan. He has a plan for you. Don't give up. And don't blame him. See, a lot of our attention, we, get, we start blaming God. But there's a real enemy that's out there, and he wants you to blame God because that causes division. Stop blaming God. Blame the one who is really responsible. You need to blame the enemy, and then we need to look at ourselves, and we need to say, what do we need to do to change? Are y'all still with me? So here's what happened. They go back home. Ruth goes back home to, with Naomi. They're still in the valley of trouble. Naomi is older, and she's tired. She's got nothing. She's just... You know, you've seen people that just have basically nothing to live for and they start withering away. That's kind of the picture I get here with Naomi. And Ruth says this in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, one day Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Imelech. While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And I want to stop right here because I think right, th- right here, this is so important. This is so important. Ruth has decided I'm going to bow myself to the help. I'm going to, it doesn't matter how low I am, I'm going to lower myself because I'm going to go behind the harvesters and pick up what's left behind. Because that's important too. What did Jesus do for us? People have come through, people have, they overlooked so many of the Gentiles. And Jesus has come through and he put himself on a cross and he says, I'm doing it for them. You're not the lowly people. You're the people I'm, I'm redeeming. You're the people I'm purchasing. You're the people I'm doing this for. Boaz, who's this picture of Jesus, says, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? There are a lot of people in this world that Jesus, he knows who you are, and he wants you to belong to him. But we as Christians have to be like a Boaz who's willing to go and ask questions and talk to people and say, who is that person? Do you know if they love Jesus or not? See, this is such a great example of redemption and also witnessing, evangelism. Loving people no matter what. And we have to do that because that's what Jesus is a picture of. That's what he does. He loves people no matter where they're at, no matter what they look like. He loves people and he wants them to come home. And we have to have that same desire. We have to have that same desire. Look, this place is going to grow slowly, but it will explode and multiply when we love people and bring them to the kingdom of God. And you're going to hear me say that a lot when I speak because I believe in it. I believe in leading people to the Lord. And I believe that God will give you the strength and the words to say when the time was right. But I also believe that we have to look for the opportunities. And we as Christians, we don't always do that. Boaz saw an opportunity here. He saw Ruth. And he talks to her, finds out who she is. In verse 10, it says, Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I am only a foreigner. I am only is a huge statement. I am only. Look, Jesus doesn't stop with I am only. 
He takes us from that valley of trouble where we think, I am only this. And Jesus changes us and says, yeah, but you're about to be this. Verse 11 says, yes, I know, Boaz replies, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. And verse 12 changes everything. This is where the change begins. Verse 12 says, may the Lord, the God of Israel, whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. What did he just do? He brought a little encouragement to her. He brought a little hope to her. When we speak encouragement over people, what do we do? We bring a little hope. We bring a little bit of Jesus with us. We bring some hope. How many of us need hope every day? How many of us want encouragement every day? I need it. I know we all need it. We all need someone to just say, hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, I just love what you're speaking on. I love what God's doing. I love how I can see God in you. There's no greater compliment to me than when somebody says, God spoke through you. Good, because I don't want it to be me. And that's got to be our attitude. May the Lord reward you fully for what you have done. What is he doing? He's taking someone who says, I am only, and he just passed on a blessing. He just passed on a blessing. He blessed her when nobody else would. Yeah, they let her pick up the trash behind them. But nobody had blessed her. Now she's blessed. And for Boaz to do this, this is a big deal. This is huge. So what, what happens after that? I, I believe that Boaz saw something in her. I saw that Boaz saw, saw an attitude in her that said, I will never give up. I will push through. She never complained. She never gossiped. She never went on mypitifullife.com and blogged about it. She didn't do any of that. All she did was submit herself and do what she knew was right to do. He's going to reward her. Now, if we skip down a little bit more, there's a big party going on, and Naomi gives Ruth some instructions of, of how to uh, talk to Boaz. And so we're going to skip down to ch from chapter 3 to verse 7. It says this, after Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down around, Bo around midnight. Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me. For you are my family redeemer. Isn't that what we want Jesus to do? Why would she go to his feet? Why would she go to his feet? See, I, I just believe that this is another picture of Jesus. What does the Bible say is under Jesus' feet? Everything is under his feet. His enemies are made a footstool under his feet. Isn't that what the word says? Everything is under his feet. And if I can just get myself to the feet of Jesus, if that's as close as I can get, that's as, I'll do whatever it takes to touch him because I need that covering. If he just covers me with his blessings, if he just covers me with his anointing, if he just covers me with his grace, if he just covers me with his encouragement, oh man, I need it, I want it, I will do whatever it takes to get there. Not only did Boaz restore hope in her, not only did he pass on a blessing to her, but he spread the corner of the covering over her. Why? Because he's the family redeemer. He's the family redeemer. You may be in a valley of trouble right now. And I don't know where you're at. But there, we all have to go through it. We all have to travel through this valley of trouble. And we've talked about this valley of trouble. But what happens? See, in this story, Boaz goes, 
before family members and says, I want to redeem them. I'm going to buy them back. I'm going to purchase them back. I'm going to purchase them back, and then I'm going to marry her, Ruth. And that's what happens. He purchases them back. He lifts Naomi's name up. He lifts the whole family up. He brings them back to a place where others see them. He redeems them. He bought them. What has Jesus done for us? He redeems us. He bought us with his blood. So what is the key to the gateway of hope? I've already mentioned it once. And it's this. We have to submit ourselves. It's submission to God. It's submission to his authority. It's submission to his desires. It's, decision. it's submission to his will. Submission. She, see, Ruth submitted herself to, to Naomi, to God, and to Boaz. And she was redeemed. She went to his feet. Submission. We have to, one of the keys is submission to the will and plans of God. You may not see his will. You may not understand what's going on. But there is a plan and it's there. But the only way we're going to get to it is if we submit ourselves. We have to submit. We have to bow before him. You know, I know Christians that don't believe in bowing before God. And then they get mad at God. Why isn't God working for me? You got to learn to bow. You got to learn to go at his feet. There's a, uh, I'm sure you've all seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And there's one scene that, there's a couple scenes that, that always get me. But one of the scenes is when Mary, Jesus is on the, on the cross and Mary comes up and she just kisses his feet. They are bloody, they are nasty, they are dirty, they are horrible. But she kisses his feet. I don't think that was put in there for, for just a simple reason. I think it has significant reason. I just want to, if all I get to do is kiss his feet, that's what I want to do. But this is what Jesus does. He says, no, I'm going to take you from this valley of trouble. You've submitted yourself, your heart's desire to me. I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to take you into the gateway of hope. And I'm not just going to leave you at the feet. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to bring you close to my bosom, and we're going to go and do this together. Because Jesus doesn't just stop there. See, Here's the deal. The enemy gets to stop at the feet. We don't. We get the full embrace of our Savior. So this Palm Sunday, as we are thinking about Easter this week, and, and, and Easter is approaching us, stop thinking of yourself here. Jesus wants the full embrace. He wants to use you. There are people around you this week that need to know about the love of Jesus. They need to know what he's done. Because all throughout this week, all you're going to see on Discovery Channel and the History Channel are a series of shows that say, this is not Jesus. Jesus was not the Son of God. He was, a good, he was a good man, but that's all he was. He was more than that. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the triumphant one. He is the one who rose from the dead. He is the one who came and talked to us. He went up to the clouds, and he's coming back. That's who he is. That's who my Jesus is. That's what I want. See, hope can never die. It can never die. It can never die because Jesus is alive. So in that moment where you feel that hope is dying, Jesus is alive. Remember that. That moment where you feel like I have lost time, I have wasted time, oh, I, I have something for you. Uh, there's no such thing as lost time. There's just redeemed time. Stop thinking you've lost time. We've lost this. We can't get it back. Jesus can. And he'll make it better than before because that's what he did with Ruth. That's what Jesus did with the rest of us. He makes it better than before. Don't put yourself on your timetable. You need to go to Jesus. Go on his timetable. I want to ask our worship team to come up. Some of you may be traveling right now in that valley of trouble. You may be struggling right now. You may be looking around going, I have maybe this much hope. That's okay. 
Jeremiah had that much hope. But this is what happened with Jeremiah. As he says, yet I still dare to hope. He says this, when I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Wherever Jesus is, hope is reborn. Wherever Jesus is, hope is ignited. Hope stirs us up. Wherever Jesus is, hope will overflow. Some of you just need a good kick of hope. We have that this morning because Jesus is here. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up. And I don't care if, you, if you've lost some hope in your business. Maybe some of you have lost some hope in your marriage. Some of you have lost hope in just your purpose. Come get prayer. Come get prayer. Hope can be reborn today. And if these two people get filled up, if they have people praying, we will get other people to pray with you. I promise you will get prayed for. I will come down and pray. Lord Jesus, I just come before you right now and I just speak hope over everyone in this room in Jesus' name. I say that by the power of the blood of Jesus that you will ignite hope in each person, Lord God. But Lord, I ask that we would be obedient, that we would bow, that we would submit ourselves and we would come before your feet, Lord. And as we are at your feet, Lord, I know that you are just gonna extend your arms and pick us up. So Lord, I pray for that this morning. Lord, I, I just pray that people will feel your embrace. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, come and pray. If you, if you are doing good and life is great, then stand up and let's worship together. The earth will shake and tremble before someone in their path this week that doesn't know you. Use them. 
Use us, Lord, to spread your word, to spread your love, to spread your glory. We ask these things. Protect everyone throughout the week and let your purpose be fulfilled through us. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you guys. We will see you next week on Easter Sunday. Thank you.